good morning to friendship here in the sanctuary, but also in virtual land. We thank God for this opportunity of another empowerment lecture this morning in which we study in the word of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come thanking you, Lord. Thank you for this morning. You allowed us to see a brand new day. Lord, we thank you, God, for this time in which we have gathered here to study your word. Lord, we just pray right now, God, that you would just bless us this morning. Bless this empowerment lecture. Uh, allow your uh, spirit to teach us what your word says this morning, that we may apply it to our lives, that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we pray and we thank you. Amen. The scripture this morning is in Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And the title of this lesson is The Faith of a Centurion. The Faith of a Centurion. Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. To give a little introduction here and a background uh, leading up to this particular passage of Scripture, Jesus Christ, in his particular earthly ministry, always sought to meet the needs of everyone whether it was Jew or Gentile, whether it was rich or poor, whether the person was a leader or a servant, a ruler or a slave. During his earthly ministry, he bridged the gaps the prejudice and the division between men. Now, the one essential um, that the people who experience the presence and the power of Jesus Christ was simply just to have what? Faith. 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 Believing, belief. And it's amazing because a lot of times when it comes, a lot of times the human aspect is that when we are looking for God to meet a particular need, especially if it's something beyond our understanding or beyond the ability of what we are able to do, we want to try to figure out how God is going to do it. But faith says, I don't need to know how he's going to do it. I just need to believe and trust that he will do it. Okay. So faith is very important because of the fact is, is that we are trusting in a divine power that is that is able to deal with a particular situation or circumstances when we don't know what to do. Okay? So a faith, a person must have faith in the Lord and his power. And the fact is clearly demonstrated in what happens between this particular centurion in the text and Jesus Christ. And if you note, as you will read in the passage, but also in other uh, translations, that Jesus actually referred to the centurion's faith as great faith. A faith 
that is not just a plain, ordinary, simple faith, but a faith that is mature. Because we can believe, <laughs> we can believe a lot of things, but is that belief built upon a strong, unshakable foundation? Okay, now, looking at verse 1, to apologize. Okay. Now, when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. Now, looking, let's go back, because I'm also dealing with the background here, is that in this particular text leading up to um, this particular um, um, text here is that when Jesus started his earthly ministry, he went to the Jews first. Okay? The Jews rejected him. And then he left he left that particular area, Nazareth. He left uh, Judea. He went to a particular place called Capernaum. Now, it was during this particular time that he still began to preach and teach, but his audience began to expand beyond just the Jews and went into the Gentile territory. Okay, now the Jews were the ones who embraced, they were looking for the Messiah. They embraced the fulfillment of the law of Moses, but they rejected the fulfillment of the Messiah. And so Jesus left and went to an unbelieving territory where the people accepted Jesus quicker than his own people. So now he is preaching, he's teaching, the people are astonished. The scripture says that his word was with power, his word had the authority of God's spirit, his message had the power of God's spirit upon it, quickening the word to the heart of the hearers. So now we find here, we go in verse 2, and it says that, and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. So now we're introduced to a centurion. We're introduced to a Gentile military commander. And this particular uh, military commander who oversees thousands of Roman soldiers, but yet he hears about Jesus. Now let's go back, let's deal with verse two. This centurion soldier had servants, okay? Now he was over soldiers, but he also has what? Servants in his own house. Now, the very interesting thing about the Roman Empire and about Gentile nations during that time is that they was always noted for their ruthlessness toward people that were not like them. And so they was harsh even toward their servants and their slaves. But this particular servant of the centurion had a special place in the centurion hearts. Now, 
the first point that we see from this is that love cares deeply for people. This centurion, even though he was a Gentile in a Roman empire that was noted for not showing emotion or love, yet this centurion had a deep love and care for his own, for a servant in his own household. Now, it's very interesting because this As I said, in the society of that day, a servant was nothing but a property that could easily be replaced. Okay? But yet, the centurion had love for this particular uh, servant, and he cared for this servant and did not want to lose, lose him. So now, let us go into verse 3, where it says here, And when he had heard of Jesus... He sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when he came to Jesus, he besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. Now, we find here in verses 3 through 5 that great faith will always seek the power of God. Great faith will always seek the power of God. Now, here's a centurion. He's a what? A Gentile. But yet, look what he's doing. He asks Jewish elders to help him by relaying a, Jesus, uh, a message to the Jew, Jesus Christ. They beg him to come and to heal the centurion servant. Now, question is, why should Jesus interrupt his usual business to go and take care of a Gentile servant, especially when Jews hate Gentiles? And the Jewish oppressor was a Gentile nation, the Roman Empire. Because it was unusual for a Gentile to care for the Jews. But yet, this centurion was what? Different. He was different. He sought God. He had heard about the God of Israel, and accepted him despite the hostility and the rejection of the Jews. He was a man of faith, a man who loved God, and because of his love for God, listen to this, he used his own resources to build a synagogue. A Gentile. I'm just really setting up right now, describing this Gentile, because it's amazing because the Gentile actually has more of a reputation than the ones who claim to know Jesus. He used his own resources. His love and faith was so strong in evidence that those that had despised him now felt close to him, close enough to do what? To intercede for him. Because mind you now, he asked the Jewish elders to go to Jesus and say, come and heal my servant. And Jesus' response was what? Because of his love and seeing the need, he went to see about this centurion servant. Now, let's look at verse six through eight because this is really i believe is the meat of, of the lesson here then jesus went with them and when he was now not far from the house the centurion sent friends to him saying to him lord trouble not thyself for i am not worthy 
that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he do it. So now we find here in verses 6 through 8 that great faith feels unworthy in approaching Jesus Christ. Now, let me break that down and explain that. As Jesus got close, the satyrian sent a what? A second message. Okay? This time, it was by, friend, by people that he trusted as his friends. Okay, now, acknowledging Jesus as Lord. The centurion recognized that Jesus outranked the centurion. The centurion did not say, my servant is not worthy to have you come. But he said, I am not worthy. Now, the centurion felt unworthy to approach Jesus himself because, number one, he was a soldier and trained to take life and then the centurion also recognized that he was a sinner. A Roman heathen. Totally unworthy and rejected in the eyes of most. But he did not allow the sense of unworthiness or pride to ask for help. Getting to the point here. Now, socially, when it comes to the world and when it comes to society, that you got people that are in a higher position that thinks that they are more worthy than what they ought. And you got some of them who seem to think that they are uh, more worthy than their creator. And they think that God owes them. Because of my status, God better do this for me. And guess what? You got some of those in the church too. The greater proclaims his to the lesser. Society considers the interior greater than the poor preacher from Nazareth. But guess what? The centurion humbled himself. So when he says I'm not worthy, even though I have a high position, I recognize that my position is not greater than the God of Israel. And if we are to experience God's blessing in our life, in our situations, then guess what? We too must confess our inadequacy and our unworthiness before Lord. I've said this many times. There's only two things that we're living on. Thank you. Say it again. Grace and mercy. Only two things that we're living on. And Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord, and he is the one 
who alone has the power to meet our needs. And therefore, because we're living on God's grace and mercy, that guess what? We got to go to him and look to him. But we just can't go to him and look to him, recognizing of God's grace and mercy, but we got to do what? We got to believe and trust also. We got to have faith that we receive. Listen, it is through faith in Jesus Christ that we receive his mercy and his grace because none of us deserve it. Now, Great faith not only feels an unworthy before the, uh, the creator, but also great faith takes the Lord at his word. Notice what the centurion, the message in the centurion says. He says in verse 7, Wherefore neither thought, I myself the worthy to come unto thee, but what? Say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. In other words, the satirian said, you don't even have to come to the house. Just speak the word. Now, why did the satirian did not want Jesus to come to the house. Okay. According to Jewish law, for a Jew to enter a Gentile house is to defile himself or herself. And the satirian respected Jesus' authority and wanted him to exercise his authority by doing what? Speaking a word of healing upon his servant. In other words, the satirian recognized that even if Jesus was on his way or in the house, or whether he was still in Capernaum, the satirian trusted that Jesus had the power that he can be wherever he is and still speak a word, and guess what? That word will go to where the situation is. The book of Isaiah says is that God's word will go out, and it will go and accomplish and touch wherever it is and do it. It will not come back void. In other words, the word of God can, can, can travel anywhere. I may have a family member sick in Chicago. I don't have to tell God to go to Chicago and heal my family member. All I got to do is say, Lord, touch my cousin in Chicago. Speak a word in that situation, and guess what? I'm trusting God is going to do the rest. That's basically what the satirian really was saying. He was a man of faith illustrating perfectly what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says what? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And that he that believes and trust in, I'm paraphrasing, would do what? That he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The satirian had diligently sought Jesus, believing that Jesus could meet his needs. And you got many believers that would seek the Lord, but the satirian faith teaches us 
that the word of Christ is all we need. It is great faith when we trust Christ to work just by speaking the word. Verse 9 and 10, I'm getting ready to close this out. Verse 9 and 10 says, When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that follow him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returning to the house found a servant whole that had been sick. So we here find, lastly, in nine, verses 9 through 10, great faith will stir up the power of Christ. Luke did not report how Jesus cured the servant. As I said earlier, is that a lot of times in a human perspective, we want to know how God did it. It doesn't matter how God did it. What does matter is that God did it. This is not the point. Jesus responded to the satirian words in the same way that crowds respond to his miracle. Jesus was amazed. Now, here's a very interesting thing. Now, when the Lord is amazed at our faith, that says a lot. Jesus even commended the soldier for his faith. Not for who he was or for what he had done as a soldier, but he commended the centurion faith because this Gentile unbeliever had more faith in Christ than his own Jewish people. And that's the reason why he says, I say unto you, I have not found so much faith. No, not in what? Israel. Because remember now, Jesus went to his people first. The one that was supposed to have been looking for Jesus. And they did what? Rejected him. He went to a Gentile nation and somebody, Gentile, accepted Jesus quicker than his own people. Therefore, Jesus healed the servant, and his power proved his messiahship, that he was truly the son of God. Now, the thought is that, and I'm getting ready to close this out, that not many believe, but yet belief in Christ is the foundation upon which our Christian life is built. Jesus Christ has the power, uh, well, let me say this, yeah. Jesus Christ has the power um, to meet all of our needs regardless of what we are facing. Therefore, we must believe that Jesus Christ can meet that particular need. So in this passage, we find a satirian who, though he was a Gentile, understood who Christ is. The satirian faith is simple, but not simplistic. The satirian understands that all authority, even though he had authority, but he understood that all authority come directly from God. And this particular uh, passage here is significant, not just because the Gentile has faith, but he has what? Great faith. He has mature faith. Great faith is a faith far beyond the Jewish elders who knew that Jesus could heal but refused to follow him. Great faith is a faith beyond the crowd who often follow hoping for another miracle or a sign. A faith like this was found in no one in Israel, not even his own disciples. And being an Israelite, being an authority, or being a religious or political leader, 
doesn't matter. Jesus is looking for great faith. The ability to believe that God can and will do what he promised. And Jesus Christ used the centurion's faith to predict that a great revival among the Gentiles in the future. So when you look here at this particular passage here is Jesus is actually teaching and showing us that the Jews, because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, that it opened up an opportunity for the Gentiles to be engrafted into the kingdom of God. So the centurion was not a son of Abraham by faith, by birth rather, but he became a son of Abraham by what? Faith. So when it comes to having great faith, that faith is trusting and believing that God is the only one that can meet all of our needs. But we got to be willing to do what? Recognize the Lord for who he is. Regardless of our position, regardless of what our status is in life, that Jesus is able to go beyond the div diversity, to go beyond the gaps, to go beyond the classes. Because why? Because he came to die for all. Regardless of where we are. Whether you're in the rich house, he died for you. If you're on the streets, he died for you. But the key denominator is trusting in Jesus Christ. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay. God bless you. Thank you, Reverend Parker, for that wonderful lesson this morning. Um, again, that came out of, um, for if you joined a little bit later this morning, the topic of the lesson was Faith of a Centurion, Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. And as Reverend Parker was teaching, I, I thought about, um, I watched this show called The Chosen. It's an excellent depiction of the ministry of Jesus Christ through the eyes of his disciples. Um, it's streamed, so it's not, on tele it's not really on television yet. But they, in this current season of the show, they played out this, this story, and it brought me to tears because they told it a little differently. They actually had the centurion going into um, Simon's home where Jesus was, and he kneeled before Jesus and, and said those words that, I'm not worthy to come to you, but I know that if you send a word, my servant will be healed. And again, it moved me to tears because the Lord was showing me there very closely what um, Reverend Parker was sharing is that we had, I'll say this, in the show they depict it as the centurion hearing and seeing all the miracles and all the things that Jesus had done in his ministry, and he believed because of what he had seen and heard. And what the Lord was showing me was that's our responsibility. We are responsible for telling people about Jesus and what what he's done for us, how he's saved us, how he's, how he's rescued us, how he's delivered us. And that will help increase their faith and bring them to Jesus. And that, that really just um, really touched me and, and it challenged me even to think about how am I telling my story? How are we telling our story of how Jesus saved us and how 
um, he continues to show up in our lives in those little tiny miracles every day. So again, thank you, Reverend Parker, for clearly laying out that lesson this morning. I don't have many announcements. I just wanted to uh, share the lesson title for next week, um, Sunday, April 21st, Faith of an Anointer, coming from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. A lot of you have shared with me that you are really excited about um, reading the lesson beforehand, and that just fills my heart with joy because that help, that shows that what we're doing is helping to have an impact on you and your personal study. So take some time to read that um, over the next week. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, Faith of an Anointer. Thank you all so much again for coming out this morning and for tuning in virtually, um, and we'll transition to morning worship. Thank you.